The word pixel probably doesn't come to mind when you think of Affinity Designer. After all, isn't this a vector program? Well, it turns out Designer has some raster-based features that can make your job a lot easier. So let's look at the pixel persona. What's up guys, it's Trent, and today we're talking about the pixel persona in Affinity Designer. First of all, what is a persona? Well, in Affinity products, you can think of personas as different workspaces that make it easier to do certain types of tasks. Now I've opened Affinity Photo here and in all the Affinity products, you can see the personas in this top left corner here. So in Affinity Photo's case, it has its default persona here and then it also has the liquify persona. So if I go here, I can do liquify on things. There's also the develop persona, which is the more detailed camera controls. There's the tone mapping. And then like many Affinity products, there's the export persona. I covered the export persona in a separate video in both Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo. So check that one out if you're interested in it. But let's go back now to Affinity Designer, which is the program we're here for. And you can see Affinity Designer has three personas. There's again, the default persona, which you probably use the most. And then there's the pixel persona, and it also has an export persona. Now the pixel persona helps us quickly do simple raster operations on our work. And this is really convenient because it means we don't have to constantly switch to other programs to do these simple operations like use a paintbrush or dodge and burn or do masking. Now, of course, it doesn't have all the features of Affinity Photo, but it does have some stuff that's really useful and I've used a lot. Now, let's just do a quick little review of vector versus raster. So I have a simple image here and on the left, I have a vector circle and on the right, I have a raster circle. Now, at this distance, they look pretty much the same, but actually, if you zoom into it, You'll start to notice on the right here, this is my raster image. You get this aliasing effect on the edge, kind of the jaggies as they're called. But if I keep zooming in infinitely, you'll see that my vector on the left always remains smooth. And this is because vectors are built from lines and points that can be scaled infinitely just by using simple math. But of course, raster images have their uses. They're great for photographs and they're used a lot in digital painting. So there are situations where you'd want to bring in a raster image, like a photo, to something that's more of a vector-based work. Okay, so let's start looking at the pixel persona. But first, I just want to mention that I upgraded to Affinity Designer 2.2. Most things are pretty much the same, but if I notice any differences, I'll try to point them out. Now, what I did here is I created this document, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a bitmap image, a JPEG that I have. So let's go to File, Place. I'll place my demo image, and it's really big, so I'll shrink it down so it fits my canvas. Now I'm in the Affinity Designer persona right now. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over to the Pixel persona. So I'll click Pixel persona. Now, one of the most important concepts to understand, especially when using the Pixel persona, is the difference between an image layer and a pixel layer. Now I brought this image in and it is currently an image layer. How do we know that? Well, if I hover over here, you can see there's this little picture here. It says image. Now I think in the old versions, it used to actually have like some text here that said image also. And I kind of like that, but now it's just this icon apparently. So it's an image layer. So what does this actually mean? Well, an image is essentially an object. You can rescale it up and down. You, you can move it around and everything like that. And the great thing is that it's going to remember the resolution of the image. So you're not losing that type of data that comes with it or even the color data. So as I rescale it and move it around, notice how up here it has this file size it's still actually the same file size, even if I make it bigger or smaller. And this is actually a really nice feature because some programs, when you import an image, it resizes the image to your size of the canvas, which is kind of annoying because you, you might want to have that high resolution image as a reference to use later. Now I said there's this concept of an image layer and a pixel layer, but I still haven't really showed you an actual example of what the difference is. So let's look at that now. So something you'll probably do in the pixel persona is you'll want to paint with a paintbrush. So I'll select this paintbrush over here. And let me see what they have for brushes. So I'll just check something that looks interesting. And by the way, if you don't see the brushes, you can go to window brushes. They might not be there by default. And I'll go to color. Let's pick something really bright green. And now I'll start painting on my image. So let's do this. And you notice this assistant came up and it said the assistant rasterized the layer that previously was selected. Now, if you click this assistant button, you may not have never seen this before. There's actually options where it'll tell you like what you can have it alert you for of different things it did. I don't really configure this much, but it's kind of useful to know what's happening. So I'll close this. But what it said is that it was converting our image layer to a pixel layer because we were trying to paint on it. So now if I hover over my image, you can see it says it's a pixel layer and I can start painting on it more. 
So this goes to what I was saying before about an image being basically a whole object that you can't really edit the inside of. It has to rasterize it, which means it says, okay, now you want to actually work on the pixels in this image. I'm gonna convert it to a pixel layer. So I hit undo. So now we're back to just a regular image again. And the problem about painting on a layer that I really don't like is that there's two reasons. One, it locks you into the resolution. So when you start painting here, it actually will create a raster image that is only the pixels that you actually see on the screen. It's not gonna keep your image information. The more severe thing is that it's actually a destructive process to paint over your original image. So let me show you something I think is a better approach. And that is that when you have your image layer selected, you can actually click add pixel layer. And now if you actually wanted to paint, it's not giving me that warning anymore because I'm actually painting on the layer above it. And the great thing about this is you can toggle it on and off. I can erase things if I don't like it. I can paint in some other color. Again, it's all non-destructive. I can toggle this on and off or I can just delete it, which I'm gonna do now. So there are many scenarios where you may wanna use a paintbrush in Affinity Designer. Maybe I wanna to touch up this painting. Maybe I don't like this shadow here under her eye or this leaf. And this is kind of give you an example of a workflow that I might do. I would add a pixel layer. And then making sure I'm on the pixel layer, I could select a brush and I would do something soft, you know, one of these round brushes. And if you hold Alt and you drag around, it'll give you the option to pick a color. So I'll pick one of the colors from her skin. And I'll just kind of lightly like paint it in. And you can toggle it on and off. So that's before, after, before, after. Maybe this leaf I don't like here. So I changed my mind about that. Let's see. I'll paint in here like this. Again, I'm holding Alt and I'm sampling and I'm just kind of painting over. I'm on this pixel layer above. And I have a very soft brush and you know, my opacity, I turned my opacity down a bit. It's kind of low here. So I took out the leaf. So we have an example of kind of a touch up thing you might do. So this is the original now, I'll zoom out original with a little bit of a touch up. So, you know, if you have Affinity Photo, I'd probably recommend that for this type of thing, but it's possible to do in Affinity Designer, which is actually pretty cool for a vector program. Now, some other tools we have over here are Color Dodge and Color Burn. I always think Dodge looks like a magnifying glass, but it's not, it's the Dodge tool. And what these will do is we, they will lighten and darken your image respectively. So let me check the Color Dodge tool. And if I'm on my image here, what I can do is I can select something and you can see it's lightening up my image, which is the dodge effect. But the problem is you can see that the assistant comes up and it tells me it rasterized my layer. So this is basically what we don't want to have happen. And the same issue would happen if we use the burn tool. So I don't like that because it's destructive and later on we can't really alter it easily. We're kind of permanently changing our image. So let me undo this before I go too far down this path. I think a better way to do this in Affinity Designer is to create a new pixel layer and then change the blend mode to color dodge. And then go back and select your original brush, just a normal paint brush. And I'll select something that's um, kind of round and light. So that one, and I can see I can actually add this effect, which is pretty extreme here, but I'm just doing it for demonstration. And I'm still keeping my image as an image layer and I can toggle off the dodge effect. And you can do the same thing with burn. So I'll do a burn layer. Maybe I want to darken her hair or something like this. I'll just do an extreme example so you can see what's going on. But this is what the burn tool does. It makes things darker. And now I can easily tog my layer on and off because this is separate pixel layer. And I still have my image down below. But we're not gonna be doing too much dodging and burning in this video, so I'll just delete these. Now, one thing I wanna emphasize is Affinity's concept of locking layers, which might not be what you expect because it wasn't what I expected at first. So let me create a new pixel layer just to show this so you don't get burned the way I got burned. And I have a paintbrush. I'll just draw some design on this new layer. Let's say I don't want that to change. So you can lock it. And what that means is when something is locked, it means you can't actually drag it around anymore. So you can't drag it around in your image. However, you can still actually paint on that layer perfectly well. So you can see the layer is locked, but I'm still painting on it. Now, a lot of programs, when you lock a layer, they'll prevent you from even painting on it or doing anything on it. And I kind of like that because it prevents you from overwriting your own work. But just keep in mind that the Affinity products don't work that way. So it's entirely possible that you can lock a layer and still draw on it. And you might be drawing over your own work. So just make sure that's not what you want to do. Now, another thing you do with raster images is you commonly copy and paste part of it. So for example, we have these tools over here, the selection tools, and you have the standard ones, you know, the square, the rectangle, you have the selection brush, which is kind of a smart selection tool. But let's just do a simple selection with our rectangle brush. And I'll select part of the image here. 
Now I have the image layer selected. So let me do control C, control V. And it copied it. But what did it actually copy? Well, let's hide the other stuff. You can see that it actually just copied the whole image. It didn't just copy my selection. And the reason it did that is because our image is still an image object. And just like we couldn't paint within the individual pixels, we can't copy and paste the individual pixels. So if you want to actually copy part of the image itself, you need to rasterize it. Now I said rasterizing is destructive, which it is, but one thing you can do to get around that is copy this layer and rasterize that and leave your image as a backup. So I'll do this right now. I'll duplicate the layer. Let me, let me hide everything that's not that. This is our copy. I'll call this our original. So I'm just gonna show our copy here. And what I can do is I can right click on it and I can say rasterize. And now if I hover over this here, you see it's a pixel image. And if I go to my selection tools, I'll select part of it. Control C, Control V, and I'll hide that copy. And this is basically our cut and paste. So this is what we got. So why is rasterizing such a risky operation? Well, if I take this selection, I undid it. So now our copy is back to an image again. So this is an image. If I make my image really small, well, if I make it bigger, it still maintains the quality, right? However, if I make it really small, and then if I rasterize it, now when I make it bigger, it's all pixelized. So of course, normally you wouldn't make it that small and rasterize it, but this kind of just shows you the concept of losing the image quality when you rasterize something. Now, all this is to say that sometimes you do have to rasterize an image, but just make sure you keep a copy of the actual image itself before you rasterize it. That way you always have that high quality backup available. Now, something else the Pixel Persona is really nice for is making pixel art. Now, here we have this kind of character, a female warrior that looks like it could be really great for a video game. I didn't create this. This was created by Hyptosis, and I put a link to his work down in the description. So be sure to click through that if you want to see the original image. But the nice thing about the Pixel Persona is you actually have the pixel tool here. And this is good for actually making pixel by pixel selections. So if I zoom in, I can actually make individual pixels. Now, one thing that's a good practice is to do view show grid. And if you zoom in, now you can actually see the actual squares that make up the pixels. And sometimes when doing this, I also like to just add a background so I don't see the transparency. So I'll make a white background. You can make the background any color you want. Sometimes you make it like um, green, just so you know what is not part of your character. But I'll leave it white just because green might annoy you. And following our best practices, I'll edit this, but I'll actually add a pixel layer so I'm not destroying my original source here. So I'm back in the pixel persona and I'll select the pixel tool. And you know, maybe I wanna add some blood to the sword here. Something cool like that. You can draw these rectangles. Maybe I want some kind of like blue on her shoulder pads here. Kind of some gold plating there. But this tool is really nice for precise art that just needs to be pixel perfect. Now one of the best uses of the pixel persona is that it supports the most advanced features of masking in Affinity Designer. There are some masking abilities in the designer persona itself, but I like to use the pixel persona because there you can use the brush itself to add texture to your masks. And by the way, I'm working on a longer video about masking. So if you wanna be notified when that comes out, be sure to subscribe to my channel and it makes it more likely that you get recommended that video. But in the meantime, what I'll say is that I have this text here and it's just a text layer. You can see it's a text, art text. And what I'll do is I'll add a mask to it by clicking this mask layer button here. And the way masks work is that you paint on them and black will conceal the object it's masking and white will reveal it. So right now you can see my whole word because it's all white. Let me select black here. And if I paint on it with this brush, I have this brush, it's kind of like a rough, um, I don't know, rake, I guess it's called. But if I paint on my mask, you can see it's actually like cutting through it. If I zoom in, you can see the background behind the letters. And I can select another brush. I can do other kind of effects here. I can do like ink splatter. And the nice thing is that if you go too far, like if I totally erase this A or something accidentally, or almost erase it, if I select white again, this paints it back in. Now, in case it's not clear what the mask is doing, let me bring it down lower. So if you notice, you can see through to the yellow behind it. And you know, this text, I can always type something else. So that part isn't destructive at all. And even though I've masked my text, I can still change the color of my text. I can add effects to it, like a drop shadow or something. So I like the way that looks there. 
Now the mask effect itself is gonna have some type of resolution based on the brush, even though your text is resolution independent, your text is vector, but the things you do on the mask could still look pixelated if you don't actually do them at a high enough resolution. So that's something to keep in mind. But this is really one of my most common uses for the design persona. It's when you're doing something that's more graphically based, more vector based, but you kind of want to do those little moments where you do want to use a brush for something. You want to mask something out. And I love the pixel persona for that. So how often do you use the pixel persona in Affinity Designer? It's something I definitely find myself going back to time and time again for those quick touch-ups and especially masking. If you have any questions about this tool, feel free to leave a comment down below. As always, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.